Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar of the Marian Fathers here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, and welcome back to Living Divine Mercy. Today is a special day in the church as we celebrate two different but important elements of our faith. The first is it is Ash Wednesday. Now, while it's not a holy day of obligation, it is nonetheless very important because it begins the season of Lent. And this is a season for us to think about God and not ourselves. In the same way, it is St. Valentine's Day, a day for us to think about others and not ourselves. We are Today is St. Valentine's Day. Yes, there really was a real St. Valentine. Archaeologists have unearthed a Roman catacomb and an ancient church dedicated to St. Valentine. But he was not kept on the calendar of the saints after 1969 because we really don't know a lot about him. In fact, there may have even been three different St. Valentines. However, for good traditional Catholics, he is still in the Roman Martyrology, which is the official list of saints. Legend says that Valentine refused to sacrifice to the pagan gods in ancient Rome. Being in prison for this, Valentine gave his testimony in prison, drawing the interest of other prisoners and even prison guards. One time, his faith was put to the test, as he was challenged to heal the judge's daughter through the name of Jesus. Valentine's powerful prayers healed the little girl from blindness, just like Jesus had done in the scriptures. And this caused many to believe in his intercessory power and the power of God. Judge Asterius was so humbled that he converted and obeyed Valentine's request that he turn away from paganism altogether. He broke all the idols around his house, and he fasted for three days prior to becoming baptized. He baptized his entire 44-member household, including the children. He then even freed all of his Christian inmates from prison. But St. Valentine was later arrested again for continuing to try to convert people to Christianity. This time, he was persecuted under the Emperor Claudius. In prison, he aided Christians being persecuted by Claudius. Now, both acts were considered serious crimes in ancient Rome. But undeterred, Valentine tried to convince Claudius of Christianity. But this time, the Roman authority became enraged. He sentenced Valentine to death, commanding him to renounce his Christian faith in order to save his life. But Valentine refused to do this. He was then set to be beaten with clubs and beheaded. On February 14th, St. Valentine's Day in 269, he died. But before he did, he left the little girl that he had healed a note that was signed, Your Valentine. This is how the tradition began. St. Valentine is now known as the patron saint of love, young people, and happy marriages. During the Middle Ages, it was believed that birds chose their mates in mid February. So this date is perfect. And this was associated with the romance of St. Valentine because he secretly married Christians against Emperor Claudius's orders. He gave his life fighting against pagan gods and spreading the love of the one true God. So let us remember the real meaning of St. Valentine's Day. Now, today is also Ash Wednesday, which most Catholics know is the first day of Lent, a time of prayer and fasting, when we get ashes placed on our forehead. Now, Ash Wednesday comes from the ancient Jewish tradition of penance and fasting. In fact, Jesus even mentioned this, saying, If the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But why ashes? Okay, the ashes symbolize the dust from which God made us. 
Our foreheads are marked with ashes to remind us that life passes away on earth and will be easily washed away. From Genesis we hear, Remember, man is dust, and unto dust you shall return. This day was first called Ash Wednesday by Pope Urban II back in 1091, but it comes from way before that. Writings from the second century church refer to the wearing of ashes as a sign of penance. We all know Christ spent 40 days fasting in the desert, and Moses did the same to repent for the worship of the golden calf by his people. As the church developed, on Ash Wednesday, the bishop would sprinkle ashes made from the palms burned from the previous year, and the penitents would then be removed from the church because of their sins. This is like Adam, the first man, who was removed from the garden because of his sin of disobedience. The penitents did not enter the church again until after 40 days of penance and confession. That's the tradition of Lent. Over the years, this discipline, but not the teaching, has changed. Today, even non-Christians um, and the excommunicated are welcome to receive ashes. So it's not like Holy Communion. The ashes can be traced on the forehead, but they have also been sprinkled on the top of the head. Also, the Catholic Church now does not limit distribution of blessed ashes to within just churches. Some priests even take them out into the streets, and you don't even have to be a priest to distribute them. But please keep in mind that it is not really appropriate to dine out or to shop or to recreate after receiving the ashes without washing them off. So it is not required for one to wear the ashes for the entire day. The most important thing to remember, though, is that Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent, and when Good Friday, the end of Lent, are days of fast for healthy Latin Rite Catholics from ages 18 to 59. This means we consume only one normal meal that day and two smaller meals that do not equal a full meal. It's really not too hard. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday are also, though, days of abstinence, meaning that no meat is eaten for anyone aged 14 years and above. Now, during Lent, this abstinence from meat extends to all Fridays, as most Catholics know. We don't eat meat on Fridays in Lent. And here's an interesting point. Did you know that all Fridays during the whole year are also to be days of abstinence, meaning we give up meat? Yes, even on Fridays outside of Lent. But the USCCB has given an indult in the United States that you can now eat meat on Fridays outside of Lent, but then you must do some other form of penance. So Fridays are still and always will be a day of penance. Let's now finish with prayer, fasting, and almsgiving as communicated to us by God in the Bible. By fasting, we are controlling the passions of the body, and we then free our souls for prayer. And then by refraining from eating, we free up food or money that we can give to the poor. And this is almsgiving. For centuries, the church has called us to practice all three together especially during the season of Lent. So refraining from food can help us to bring our bodies under the control of our spirit. It is also a way of doing penance for past sins. So the church recommends it and even requires it, as we said on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. But remember, we shouldn't lose the purpose of fasting. It isn't done to lose weight so you can look better or to save money so you can buy more things. It is to help our souls get to heaven. And finally, did you know that Lent ends up being 10% of the calendar year? So it's the perfect time to tithe for God, a tithe of 10%. You know, food is not bad, but giving up Good things, which food is, helps us to focus on what is better, God. It is a way to give up lesser goods to attain greater goods, and that is what heaven is all about. Now, earlier we said St. Valentine is the patron saint of young people. 
So let's hear the story about Camp Veritas. This is a great organization that offers summer camps to teenagers who are striving to become better in their daily life of virtue and living divine mercy. We are unabashedly, unapologetically, boldly, courageously, fearlessly Catholic. We love the truth, not a truth, not his truth, but the truth. Hence, Camp Veritas. So here we are in a time that's critical. The battle for souls is everywhere and it's intensifying. There's nothing more important that one does than work for the soul. And this is the front line. This is a boot camp for the soul. At its core, it is an intense immersion in placing youth at the foot of the cross daily. Just letting them soak and bask in the presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. In 2008, the creators of Camp Veritas waged a battle to combat the crisis of young people abandoning their faith. We have noticed a significant decline in the number of young people attending church. When you're looking at the future of the church, it depends on young people getting involved. And it depends on young people understanding the importance of the sacramental life of the church. Coming to Camp Veritas is like saying, here, there's a rope from heaven held by Christ himself. This is the moment in time where they have enough time to say, yes, I want to grab this rope or not. But this is no catechism class. Camp Veritas is a completely volunteer operated, week long play and pray experience for kids ages 12 to 18. Here, youth can connect with each other while having fun, but also embark on a journey to a deeper relationship with Christ. We want to both honor and attract young people by activities that they would find compelling, but then also within that, create a little place of community where they can build friendships and trust. These kids never feel like they're in class. It's more like recess, and by the way, here's Jesus. There's a lot of great activities at Veritas. There's soccer, there's frisbee, there's pool, lake, zip lines. It feels like a resort. I had such a fun time playing with all these different people, creating these bonds that I never imagined I would have. And we all became like friends for life. The activities play such a huge role in strengthening our relationship, not only with those bonds, but then it brings God into it. Our only hope is that the teens that come here can say, I've had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Camp Veritas attracts a multitude of selfless volunteers who give of their time, talents, and energy to reach the common goal of bringing these youth to the feet of Jesus. Without the volunteers, Camp Veritas would not exist. They are the entire backbone, they are the spine. They are with the kids from first thing in the morning to last thing at night. They are constantly um, serving them in a multitude of ways and we are so indebted to the work and the sacrifices that these saints are making for these kids. When you experience the joy of the Lord, you just can't hold it in. You are radiant, you glow, you have energy, and that just explodes. And, and the kids just, they sing crazy loud, they clap, they express themselves. The music is, I'd say, one of the best parts of camp. Um, we have so many different dances for so many different songs. The energy at Veritas is incredible. There's so much just energy around you, like all your friends in your cabin. We're all kind of together. We're all jumping for joy with Jesus. 
God is so happy for us singing and praising Him in the way that we are, and especially being so happy, and it's super fun. The spiritual component to the week is where Camp Veritas hopes to reach the hearts and minds of these youth, right where they are, and help them grow as joyful, intentional disciples of Jesus Christ. My body is not my own. My body is God's who gave it to me. I'm just a steward of it. How do I want to present this body to my spouse as part of this gift of my life to her? You could choose to be your own truth. You could just have a whole quest of life of just money, power, and sex. It doesn't lead down to a path of peace nor joy leads to a path of emptiness because you know it's a lie. Talks that we've had so far this week have really hit a spot. Like, this is not the world that God wanted us to live in and how he wanted us to live it. So with these talks, we're able to really think of like our lives outside of camp and reflect on it and be able to change for the right way and be able to live the life that God wants us to live in the way that he wants us to. The number one thing they need in their life is love. Um, and that true, authentic love can only come from Jesus Christ. When it comes down to it, when we're all in that chapel together, we are all loved by the Father immensely. When we get to come together, nothing else matters. We are all one body, we are all one church. Here at Camp Veritas, you have a joyful uh, anticipation of time before the Eucharist. And that is fostered just by allowing Jesus to do the work. Right? Camp Veritas is just trying to allow Jesus to be the one who does the great work that he always does. You have some of these kids that have been in darkness for so long. Again, you're turning on the lights, you're throwing out these seeds, but eventually they have to choose it, and not all of them do. So it's like any parent who has a wayward child. That's a deep pain because you can't choose for them. But that said, that doesn't mean you can stop trying. You've heard it from a thousand different ways that are out of my control. Bottom line is you've heard the call and you've answered that yes, and you see the fruits of it. So all I have to say is thank you. God has picked the right people you are his saints. You are his leader in this time. You're the leaders that have come up out of adversity, and that is absolutely thanks to your yes. If we all come together and bring our abilities together, we can accomplish incredible things and lead so many more souls to the foot of the cross. Well, thank you to everybody involved in Camp Veritas. What an inspiration to see young people living the faith. Now, let's hear from Father Andy. He reads in Scripture about the importance of fasting. Is not this the fast that I choose? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. Isaiah reminds us that devotional acts such as prayer and fasting should never be used as an excuse to neglect the poor and oppressed. Our religious acts are of no account if we do not have compassion for the plight of those who suffer and seek to help them ease their burdens. St. Teresa of Calcutta's entire life was centered on this teaching. 
She connected concern for the poor with the thirst of Jesus on the cross for souls. As she writes to her sisters, the heart and soul of the missionaries of charity is only this, the thirst of Jesus' heart hidden in the poor. Satiating the living Jesus in our midst is the missionary's only purpose for existing. Think of Jesus' words, Mother Teresa added. I thirst, and you did it to me. Remember always to connect the two, the means with the aim. In loving the poor, we are also relieving Jesus of his thirst his compassionate longing for the good of all. Hi, I'm Father Thaddeus, and this is Ask a Marian. Today is Ash Wednesday, a day that often raises a lot of questions, whether from Catholics or Protestants who question us as to why we do these strange things. Where do ashes come from, and where does this idea come from to use ashes on a day like today? Well, if you go to the Old Testament, you'll find many lines about repenting in sackcloth and ashes. Sackcloth was a rough kind of fabric that people would use, and they would put ashes not on their forehead right here, but actually on the top of their head as a reminder of what God told Adam after he and Eve had fallen into sin. You are dust, and to dust you shall return which is the very reason we use ashes, to remind us of the effects of our sins. Because in pride, we often begin to think that we're too big for our britches, as my dad used to tell me. And God cuts us down to size, not in a mean way, but to remind us that without his love, we really are nothing. We are but dust and ashes. And then sometimes people wonder, well, where do these ashes actually come from? And that's where we have the palms from Palm Sunday. Often there's too many to distribute. And so sometimes what the priest will do is use those very palms or ask people to bring back their palms from the previous Palm Sunday. And he will consume them in fire. And then those will become the ashes that are put upon, upon people's heads or upon their foreheads. And so we have the connection between Ash Wednesday and Palm Sunday that are almost like the two hinges of Lent, because the whole reason that we are brought to repentance as Christians is seeing the Lord who loves us so much that he voluntarily decided to die for us. Now, why do we do this on Ash Wednesday, especially at the beginning of Lent? Because it is the season of repentance. It's the season in which we prepare for Easter, not only because Jesus is risen from the dead, but because we too are supposed to be risen from the dead, which is why on the vigil of Easter, Holy Saturday night, we always read from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans where he says, you too have died with Christ once for all to sin and like him have risen in life to God once for all. And so we put these ashes on our forehead or atop our heads, especially in the sign of the cross, as a reminder that we embrace suffering, we embrace penance, we embrace conversion, not because pain is good or that we enjoy it, but to enter into the new life that is promised in Jesus risen from the dead and that is given concretely to us through our baptism. We need in this Lenten season, in this Ash Wednesday, to repent of all the times we don't boldly bear the cross of Christ and share the good news of his gospel. I'm Father Thaddeus. This is Ask a Marian. Today is Ash Wednesday. During Holy Mass, I felt for a short time the passion of Jesus in my members. Lent is a very special time for the work of priests. We should assist them in rescuing souls. Small practices for Lent. Although I wish and desire to do so, I cannot practice big mortifications as before because I am under the strict surveillance of the doctor, but I can practice little things. First, sleep without a pillow. Keep myself a little hungry. Now, during this Lent, 
I often experience the passion of the Lord Jesus in my own body. I experience deeply in my heart all that Jesus suffered, although no exterior sign betrays these sufferings of mine. Only my confessor knows about them. Well, thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Now, during Lent is a great time to read what St. Faustina had to tell us that Jesus wants us to know during this time of year. So if you'd like to get a copy of the Diary of St. Faustina, the information is there on your screen. So please join us next week as guest host Father Thaddeus will talk to us about the importance of understanding Christian prophecy. Until then, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.